All right, folks, geographers, I'm going to talk about some stuff today that will connect to your first big paper thing, which you have to do in this class, your Antelope Valley's Sense of Place essay. Um, I'm going to talk about what that is now, what it is I'm, I'm looking for from you. I go through the, the assignment description here, and then what I'm actually lecturing on, all this space and place stuff, I'm going uh, I'm gonna introduce some ideas, some concepts to you, but, you know, weave within these concepts uh, application toward your upcoming paper that you have to do, right? So we'll all explain it basically here, but then also connect stuff as we go. So the whole deal with this. First off, this ain't a big deal. College students, you should be able to handle this. I am not looking for some kind of robotic, awful, English 101 style paper of, you know, researching stuff or, or whatever. No, no offense, English 101, but you know, this, this isn't like a, an essay in that really stuffy, awful, miserable sense uh, that you're probably used to. I want to get, I just want to see you guys thinking about uh, the place around you, where you live in the Antelope Valley. And so really, I have Antelope Valley here, but pick, pick your home turf, right? What, whatever Antelope Valley means to you. That could be, um, you know, Lancaster or Palmdale or Lake L.A., or Rosamond, or up in Tehachapi, or down in Acton, or, you know, wherever. All right, so, and, and if you are, if you're one of these difficult students that I always have, like, I don't actually live here. Okay, well, you, you, wherever, all right? If you actually live, like, in North Hollywood, and you decided the best move was to go to ABC, which, if that's the case, awesome um they have other schools down closer to la but anyway if you know like if you're not actually technically within the greater antelope valley area whatever just pick where you live okay that's uh, that's what i want and if you have any concerns with any of this stuff like if it's going to be okay or if it's going to work or whatever let me know talk to me we'll we'll figure it out all right um so with this you're going to pick your location here and I want you to think about its sense of place. All right? What does this location mean to you based on your experiences with it? What makes it unique? What what really makes it, you know, like when I say Lancaster, that should probably trigger something in your head if you're familiar with Lancaster, right? Or Palmdale or or whatever. Uh, so if I say that, you should get some ideas in your head. These might be positive. They might be negative. They might be a little of both, right? That's that sense of place, right? Your thoughts and feelings about this place. But what I want you to do with this paper is really think about, like, why, why do I hate this place, right? Why do I hate Lancaster so much? Or you're going to say, why do I love Lancaster so gosh dang much, right? I don't, I don't care if it's positive or negative or whatever. Uh, that's actually one of the fun things in reading these is that I get a whole bunch of different ones, right? Where it's people like, this place sucks, I can't wait to leave. And other people are like, you know, I was thinking of transferring out of here, but I just love Palmdale so much that I'll never leave, whatever. However you feel, you're perfect, right? So there's no right or wrong there. But what I want you to do is to start thinking about this stuff but if you look at the actual uh, assignment itself down here, I'm going to give you a little, you know, kind of ease into it, um, that first paragraph. But the second one, your assignment is to take two different photographs of landscapes in the Antelope Valley that you feel represent its sense of place. So again, I have, generally speaking, Antelope Valley here, but pick it. Wh whatever it is you're doing. You're doing Rosamond? Commit to that, right? Take some pictures in Rosamond um, that connect to like, why do I hate this place? Why, or why do I love it? Or why am I kind of ambivalent about it? Or why do I actually, I kind of like it, but I kind of don't like it, right? Pick two 
locations, all right? Actual, like, you know, physical places within the greater place of the city you're dealing with, if that makes sense, all right? So think about that. Uh, and again, with all this stuff, if you have any questions, concerns, whatever, shoot me an email, talk to me about, you know, about your concern. If you have a question like, I, I'm thinking of this, would this work? Or, you know, what if I can't do this? Or what? Just talk to me about it. Um, so you're going to take these pictures and insert them into a Word document, okay? And then type up one to two pages of text explaining why you took them and how they evoke the placeness of the Antelope Valley, all right? And so that should really be, like, to re I have one to two pages of text. I'm going to be honest with you here. Um, it shouldn't be that hard to do because you're, uh, um, in, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to do this right now. I'm going to edit this right now just because you need, you need at least a page. Um, Where's the thing here? Per uh, photo. Let's see. Let's do that. Yeah. Just so I don't have garbage coming in. Not that I was, I'm thinking you would make garbage, but I'm going to do that. That just sounds better. So type of one to two pages of text per photo. All right. So you can insert photo number one, and then underneath it you can type, uh, you know, a page, page and a half, two pages, you know, connected to that one, and then you move on to the next one. Okay. It shouldn't be that hard to do. Uh, and I want you, you're going to explain them. Like this, here, here are these photos. Here's why I, I took them. Here's, you know, the sense of place of this place, you know, from my experiences. Here's why. So you're going to be just explaining this stuff. Now I do have some rules. Absolutely no Joshua Trees at sunset photographs. Right? It's garbage. Garbage. I mean, sure, it's pretty. But it's also like one thing when you think about it. That's one kind of embarrassing thing about this place is so many people when they're trying to document it and show how beautiful it can be, they wait until it's dark. Uh, and you get this silhouette of a weird tree and that's supposed to like evoke beauty. They, they can be beautiful, but let's, let's actually look at it during the day in full light, right? Or if it's something about the nights here that's important, you can wait until night. But I just, I don't want the cliche... You know, isn't that desert majestic or, or whatever? You guys are better than that, all right? You're geographers. You have these spatial skills that I want to see you unleash in this paper, all right? So don't do that. Don't do anything uh, cliche, all right? I also have an ear that I note. I am not simply looking for a public relations piece on the Antelope Valley, which is awful. When I have students like, you know, if you're looking for a good place to raise your family, Quartz Hill is the one for you. Like, like you're working for the Quartz Hill Chamber of Commerce uh, and you're trying to uh, sell the place. No, no, I don't want that. If you love Quartz Hill, bless your heart, um, then you can say that. But don't don't sell me on it, right? You're, you're explaining how you feel, not trying to get me to feel a certain way, right? Nor, continuing in here, do I want a cynical attack piece on the region. So I also, I don't want the PR fluffy... This is great, uh, but I also don't want the life sucks. I hate it here. I cannot wait to leave. Everyone is stupid. You know, I don't want that. I want to see this. We're in college. Damn it. I want to see some real thinking uh, about this stuff. All right. So you're um, so I want to see you thinking about what the place is to you personally. Your photos and text may be positive or negative in tone, but be sure to give concrete examples as to why you feel the way you do an A paper. If you're looking for that that shiny A grade, uh, an A paper will use relevant concepts and critical theories from our class to explain the sense of place of the Antelope Valley. And that's the stuff we've talked about already in other lectures, you know, talking about difference and, uh, you know, regions and diffusion, some of this kind of basic stuff, just culture in general, as well as the stuff I'm going to talk about once I, I wrap up here. And I'll give some real... I'll point out how you can use some of these concepts I'm going to talk about um, for your paper. All right. But think about that. And I don't want you to simply, you know, just use terms like, you know, I don't know, place, space, things like that, uh, and go from there. And, you know, hope I, I, I know what you're talking about. No, you're going to show me that you know 
these words, right? That you understand what these concepts are, all right? Uh, so, and down here, spell check your essay, stay on topic, all of this stuff. Like, I don't need proper MLA formatting and all that, that stuff. Just, you know, 12-point font, spell check the thing, read through it to make sure it makes sense, uh, and all of that, right? Pretty simple, basic stuff. So that's, uh, that's what I want to see. Um, the exact due date, I just moved it. Uh, you know, but, but double check when all this stuff is, um, you know, what it says now, which as you're listening to this should be what it is. Um, but if you have any questions, again, let me know. And what you're going to be submitting when you're all done, I want this done as a word document. And that's not because like, I'm not, you know, here promoting the Microsoft corporation or whatever, but it's what canvas can you know, take and I can read and it makes life easier. So you don't have to write it in Word if you're writing in Google Docs um, or what is it, a Max Pages thing or Open Office or some of these, uh, um, you know, free versions of this stuff. Although you, you should, through ABC, have free access to Microsoft Office. And if you don't know about that, you can send me an email. I'll show you the link, but you can find it on the, the website. <coughs> but, um, with this, if you if you work in say Google Docs, you should be able to you hit like save as or download as or you know something like that, and you can save the Google Docs file as a Microsoft Word document. Okay, or you can do that with a lot of these things. So save it in that format. That way, when you upload it to Canvas, I'll be able to easily read it, and I'm happy, which is exactly what you want when I'm actually grading your paper. All right, does that make sense? Um, does that make sense? Is this, hopefully, hopefully you're tracking with this. Um, so yeah, okay, if you have any questions, let me know. But that's that's what I want you to hear. You're gonna be talking about sense of place. All right, now let's come over here. And we'll uh, we'll get into some actual hardcore lecturing. Let's, let's get into some learning right here. So I'm gonna talk about place and space, hence the name of this lecture, but I want to get into some other ideas like authenticity, which is one that I love because it's so difficult and frustrating. And I remember I remember having, you know, when I started to learn about and want to use it in research projects in grad school and all that, having having professors say, eh, do you really want to do it? And yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I love authenticity. And we'll see that. When we get there, and then we'll get into this idea of front and back regions, which I think is kind of fun. And then throughout the whole thing, we're going to be talking about, as I said, your sense of place assignment. Be showing you guys how to think about this stuff as you're, you know, and how to apply it to what it is you're going to do. So let's let's get rolling. Now, class, is there a difference between space and place? You know, here's the here's the deal. I all of this stuff. I try to really not just talk to students uh, and have you know questions and discussion and get you guys talking. And here we are in a pandemic, all COVIDy, and um, yeah. So yeah, okay. We would we would argue about this, and then I have students, you know, saying things. Oh well, one of my favorite things to do um, is to to tell students they're wrong. Um, it's not a good thing uh, at all, but I love love to do it. You know, encourage you guys to share your thoughts and feelings and, and all of that. And then, yeah, then you do it, and I, and I say, God, that was, no, that was not right at all. But I do it to everybody, and, and to kind of, you know, it's really, if you pull back the curtain, it's to show that, that we all, you know, we don't know as much as we think we do when we try to put stuff into words, right? It's... Uh, it's a hoot. So at least you don't have me being a, a jerk to you. But but we'd be talking about you know space and place, and people would start to throw stuff out. And really, what it would show is that we all feel there is a difference between these two terms, but we can't necessarily put our fingers on it. So you can like right now, you can pause this. You can just say, well, I'll show you, old man, and you can write your list of like, oh, this is how I think it's different, and then keep playing it to see if 
you get it or you were close or whatever. Like, feel free. Just play along at home. But I'm just going to launch into uh, like with, with place. All right. The idea with place is it's it's a location. All right. It's a, it's a thing we can point to on a map, say. All right. And that's uh, kind of goes back to one of Steve's core concepts of, of human geography location. Right. The idea of some kind of fixed place. Um, so it's something we can point to as a building or an actual, phys you know, like just a point um, somewhere, right? Um, or it can be a kind of a larger area like Antelope Valley College, right? Would be It's more than just one building, but it's a place that's made up of kind of smaller little places in there, right? So we have kind of different scales at which this can work. Um, it's unique. Right? It's the whole sense of place idea right that it, it should be something that that is unique if for no other reason than it's at a specific location right like thinking back to like you know chain restaurants and like starbucks right you can say that uh, starbucks kind of all blend together but you can say hey this is the starbucks that's actually at this location this one's at at 10th and k and this one's at not 10th and K, you know, wherever they they are. I think there's one there. I don't know. But you get what I'm saying. And then this idea of permanence, too, which is not, I mean, you know, what is permanent, really, uh, in the grand scheme of things. If we look out, you know, billions of years into the future, will any of this stuff be permanent? But it's the idea that, like, you know, a place, it, it's going to be there for our lifetimes, is, is what we tend to think of, or at least that, that location. There's there's something connected to some sense of permanence. Now, sense of place, um, the, again, something I've, I've talked about before, what makes a place unique. It's connected to lived experience, so you have to go to the place to develop a sense of place. All right, here's a quote um, from Paul Knox and Sally Marson. Um, from uh, another intro uh, geography book, uh, but I like this one. Feelings evoked among people as a result of the experiences and memories that they associate with a place and to the symbolism that they attach to it. All right, so you can see, based on this definition, you gotta be, you gotta be connected in some way with not just going there, but but developing memories. Right, and having these experiences that are going to stay in your brain, and you're going to think back to them, and you're going to have some kind of, you know, thought uh, about this, the symbolism thing. Real simple, is it good, bad, right? It, it can be that simple, or it can be more complicated. So you you think of, you know, how do you feel about a place? That's that's part of your sense of place, and a lot of this. Can be connected to or it's easier to do this and like with your a b sense of place essay i have you guys talking about you know really where you live in the antelope valley presently um it's connected to this idea of rootedness right roots having roots in a place like you've you've lived in a place long enough well maybe it's just you maybe it's your you know family has been in a place for a while. Maybe, you know, your grandparents first moved to the Antelope Valley and you, you know, your parents stayed here and, you know, met here or whatever and, and you were born and raised here or however it is, you've got some roots in the place. Or maybe two, because this happens, uh, you, you have students who uh, are not from here, right? Not from the Antelope Valley. I'm not originally, wasn't born here. Um, so I have roots in another part of California, as well in some other places around the country where family is, where I've spent time, so I have that stuff. And then when I moved here, you know, this place was, I was an outsider. This was kind of a foreign place. It was still, I mean, come on, it was still California. It's not like I had to, you know, learn the language or, you know, learn customs, but it was still, I didn't have any connection to the place. But that was I, don't know, I moved here like 11 years ago, I think now. So now I do have roots because I've been here for a while. And so based on that, my idea of the Antelope Valley, that's changed since I first got here to this point 
in time. So that's another thing. You can look at, you know, how your feelings about this place have changed over a period of time. Or, if you're a student listening to this, and I'm talking again about the Lazy Sense of Place essay, if you're from another place, whether you're actually from somewhere else, you know, in L.A. County or up in Kern County or something like that, and you're here for now for whatever reason, um, you can play to that. Right. And I'll get into this whole insider outsider perspective. Um, or if, you know, I have other people who are from other parts of the country uh, or other countries in general and come here. Again, think about that, that you're just now developing your sense of place here. How's it going? Right? How does it connect to the place back home where you have well-established roots, wherever that place back home might be? Right, Silmar, um, uh, or you know Beijing, like, uh, depending on um, from where you're from. And we do, we have international, you know, students here, and that amazes me. Um, there were a little Antelope Valley College, but we still have students coming from all over the world. And I just think about, you know, that that thought. Like we sell the Antelope Valley and ABC is like, yeah, we're we're practically LA. We're like a suburb of LA. And that kind of makes sense, um, but at the same time, if you're thinking, you know, Hollywood and Disneyland and, and those kinds of images, and you come to Lancaster, how's that sense of place going, right? But but think about that, all right? So again, that's that's sense of place. But one thing that can be helpful here is this idea of inside versus outside perspectives, all right? So we all have this, and we shift who we are which one of these we have, depending on where we are at a given time. All right? So an insider is someone who lives in an area, is a local. Right? Insiders develop a sense of place through local culture and daily experience, through the everyday experiences that we have. Uh, right now, I'm recording this during COVID-19 and pandemic quarantine fun, um, you know, daily routine is crazy. Uh, it's not what it once was. Stuff as simple as commuting to work or going, you know, to the store or going out to a movie or a restaurant or, or whatever. You know, that's, that's definitely changed and different. But at the same time, we're just, we're kind of having these new, you know, senses of place. It, it's connected to our sense of place in this way. We're having these new experiences that are affecting all of this stuff, but it's through that kind of everyday mundane experience, right? And we get, we get this through a lot of different stuff. Um, you know, language uh, is a good one. What people say uh, about stuff. Um, you know, it, it's, it can be a whole host. I, mean, I have this whole UCLA thing. We can talk about that one. You know, one thing that that uh, got me when I moved here uh, was the the term down below, all right? And and it was the idea of anybody in the Antelope Valley who says down below, it means, you know, like Santa Clarita to Anaheim, uh, effectively. It's a, yeah, I gotta go down below. It means I gotta go to the big city. Now, that's kind of what you're saying. And what's crazy too is when I got here, that's what people said and you know picked up on it and talked to people about it and okay that that's how it works but then in more recent years i've said this to classes and like you know you guys say down below and they said what the hell are you talking about um because i think it's kind of changing some people still say it some people don't but it's one of those things where it's just you know it's kind of quaint right it's something that's just part of the antelope valley or even calling it the av or you know whatever um, that's all connected to the language that we use. We can also look at any symbolic landscapes, meaning, you know, art that's that's around, that's on the landscape. Uh, and that stuff, you know, if you're an insider, you're not looking at necessarily the big, fancy stuff. It's the small stuff that we pick up on, right, in our everyday thing. Things that we're going to only see through repeated commuting, you know, whether it's driving or walking or riding a bike or taking the bus or whatever, but it's those things that we just, we pick up on after multiple days of experiencing them, 
right? The little things that are there. That's what we're getting at. And it can be the stuff that's supposed to be there, right? Official art or whatever. Or it can be things like graffiti, right? Stuff that people have illegally placed in, in some area. That's going to, these little things, little tiny things, they're going to they're gonna affect that sense of place. And then the physical environment itself can be sights, sounds, smells, things like that. Just nature, right? Or the absence of nature or whatever. That's, that's something to think about. All right? But the thing with the insider perspective is it's everyday kind of stuff. All right? Now, outsiders, these are people who are, you know, tourists, foreigners, immigrants, people who are, are you know, moving into an area. Maybe, you know, it's the first time they've ever been to this place. They're seeing it for the first time. You're going to develop that sense of place through the big stuff, right? The big things that are there, the things that are different and are unusual. So you can think of it as like the inside stuff. It's that perspective is kind of, you know, it's not that you're not looking at unusual things or unique things or whatever, but it's you're looking beyond the real touristy stuff. And you've got that insider perspective. So if you've, you know, if you've been in the Animal Valley for a year or more, you're going to have that perspective. But if you go to another location, um, you're going to have that outsider perspective, all right? Uh, and that can be as simple as like going, as you would say, down below, right? Um, but it's the idea, like when I take my kids in the LA itself, whether we're going downtown, going to, you know, West LA, you know, Santa Monica, that side of stuff, or wherever we're going, whatever part of LA, they are getting it as an outsider. I, I at least, you know, lived down there for a little bit. So I have some kind of insider perspective stuff still that, that kind of comes back when I get down there. But for my kids, it's always, you know, or for now anyway, will be that outsider perspective. They see the big buildings or just the crazy traffic or, you know, whatever it might be. That's what they're thinking of when they're thinking of LA. What does Los Angeles mean to you? They're going to say the Staples Center, right? Because that's where they've experienced L.A. for the most part. And it's a big thing and it's this remarkable thing. And not so much like individual, you know, downtown blocks and, and streets and stuff like that that aren't remarkable. Right? If that makes sense. Um, you know, and statues. Like this, the statue of uh, Ulysses S. Grant in Washington, D.C. I just think it's a pretty awesome statue which he, he just looks you know tough it's a hat uh i think right there um but it was the kind of deal like you know i've gone to dc like twice I, yeah just twice um every time it's it's you know it's the big stuff it's seeing the washington monument and the lincoln memorial and the vietnam wall and all that kind of stuff that's that's what i think of when i think of washington dc because i've been there for these little you know short trips here and there. So my sense of place comes from that big, obvious stuff that tourists are looking at, right? So same idea, and it could be like language, you know, will be something, um, but it, it'll be like the obviously weird stuff, the, the weird way other people talk, right? Californians, are you with me? The idea that if you go to a place like Boston um, and, and you hear them talk that way, you know how the Boston people talk, I'm not going to do it. Um, it'll probably sound terrible, uh, but it's the idea, you know, or you go to the South and you hear Southerners talk and you just go like, man, you talk funny. Um, but that's going to help develop that sense of place, right? Whereas the, those who live there aren't going to think that it sounds weird because that's part of their inside perspective. That's, that's normal, right? Uh, same with symbolic landscapes, like I said, in DC and all the monuments and fancy buildings and all that stuff. A physical environment, you go to a place uh, and you're, you know, like the, the Redwoods. I think are a great example of this as uh, if you've gone up north and walked through these massive Redwood forests. I mean, it is just remarkable. Like it, 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 no matter how many times I go, you know, I've seen these Redwood trees before. But I think especially now that I live here in the desert, 
in an absence of trees, and then you go up north and you see these massive redwoods. Um, it's just, it's just amazing, all right? And that just, that amazingness is how I, you know, have generated a sense of place. Uh, you know, a, a city like Eureka, um, you know, Humboldt County in general, the, you know, places like that, right? So it's the big different stuff. So insiders have that everyday mundane um, sense of place and outsiders are going to see the big stuff, right? Whereas like for insiders, you know, here, maybe you're, uh, um, you know, used to Joshua trees, like funny spiky Dr. Seuss looking things, right? Maybe you're used to seeing those all the time. But if you're an outsider, you look at those, you're like, what the hell is going on with those trees, right? And so you can see it be the same thing, uh, but but it can affect our insider outsider perspective. So I've been you know talking about this with the Antelope Valley, but this is the point in time where we would, as a class, discuss um, you know your sense of place assignment, right? Your your paper, like how could you use this idea of an insider or outsider perspective to you know write about. One of the cities here, the city in which you live, where you spend the most time in, or whatever, right? So this picture right here uh, is of the boulevard, which just, I mean, just right there, the boulevard, right? It's this branded thing that it's not, you know, Lancaster Boulevard between, you know, a 10th Street uh, West and Sierra Highway or whatever. No, it's just the boulevard, and it's in BLVD in a very specific font and, and all that. Um, this I use as an example because everybody's got, you know, kind of an opinion on it for better or worse. Some people love it, some people hate it, but it's, it's a good way to get students talking about stuff. But just in terms of that insider or outsider perspective, think about like if you're an insider, are you going to feel about the boulevard in a different way than you would if you were an outsider? All right, that's that's uh, the way to think about it, and maybe help you know figure out you know, why do I feel the way I do about this place I'm picking? What about you know Palmdale or Lancaster or whatever? Right, think about that, uh, and I'm just I'm not gonna have a discussion by myself um, here. And if you you know have thoughts on this or want to you know chat about it or whatever questions. Let me know. Um, but I just, I think it's the thing. Like the boulevard, clearly, it's there, you know, for people who live here, right? For locals, people with that insider perspective. But it's also, it's really, it's going for you know, that outsider draw, right? It's the kind of deal where if you're an outsider, if you don't know anything else about Lancaster and you see this place and, you know, what it's got to offer. And this, this was just a photo I found online. It's not even the best thing to show, though it's showing that it's got, you know, the farmer's market going on and the idea of the little streets, it, it kind of looks just walkable, uh, you know, in general, you see people in the streets and, and uh, all that. Um, so you might look at it and be like, wow, it's got this cool place to just hang out, fantastic, this place, this Lancaster place that I've never heard of, but I just, I just accepted a job at, um, you know, I'm, uh, this is actually exciting. Lancaster looks like a hip, sexy town. And then if you're an insider, right, you, you look at this and you, you realize that now if you turn left or right, you know, off of the boulevard itself just a little bit, all of this stuff vanishes, right? It's a totally different world in here. It's this little, little sliver um, in there. So because of that, like, I mean, you could, you could, let's say, if you, you know, you wanted to pick Lancaster and, and you could just, you know, Lancaster, you think it's the best. And one of the reasons why you think it's the best, because the boulevard, because there's always something to do there or whatever, because you've got these, uh, um, you've got these experiences, you've got these memories from here, whether it's, um, I don't even know it's still open um, anymore down here, but it's like, you know, you saw a movie or you had a fun time bowling or there's a restaurant you love or you, you know, it's, it's something... You know, maybe you had a first date with somebody uh, in this area and it just, you know, and uh, now you're married or, you know, whatever, right? Um, think about, like, it's, you know, it's because I'm an insider. Or actually, I've only been here 
a few months. So I realize I still have this outsider perspective, but it works for me, right? That's what I'm getting at. So as you take a picture of one of your locations or both of your locations or your spot, one thing you can think about is like, am I an insider here or am I an outsider? And if so, like whichever one I pick, how does that affect how I feel, right, about this? How does it affect the sense of place that I've developed in this area? And so based on that, then, I mean, and that's it's pretty easy. Once you start thinking about this stuff, just start writing it down, right? Just start thinking, like, uh, you know, I chose a picture of my boulevard or, you know, whatever um, in there and, and um, you know, to represent my, my sense of place. As an insider, comma, uh, you know, I have spent many a time walking up and down the boulevard and developed a sense of place through everyday experiences, right? And so if you do that, I don't do that. I mean, I'm, I'm doing it kind of a lame way um, here. Oh, my God. If you pick the boulevard and you start it word for word like that, F minus. But you get what I'm saying. Like, put in your own words. Be a little more creative with it. Um, but, I mean, that's just, that's what you're doing. You're showing me, you're connecting the your sense of place stuff and these pictures that you took to ideas we have discussed in the class. And you're showing me you're thinking about it. You're not just saying, like, yeah, I grew up here. It, it seems cool end of story, you're showing me that I'm going to think, I'm going to actually critically think about why I feel the way I do about this place in which I live, right? That's what I want to see. So that's the inside outside stuff. And that's pretty straight forward. Let's get to space because space is where it gets a little tricky. Right, and this is another case where I'd say, all right, are my little geographers? What uh, what space? And and people would try to define. And this is really what I can kind of tear into you and say wrong and uh, and make you feel awful, but in a nurturing, loving way, and then you know build you back up and we if we work through it. So yeah, if we were actually doing this in class, oh, it'd be great. Um, but here we are. So really, with space, I'm gonna get into what it is here but it's even what i'm gonna this brief little stuff i'm gonna talk about it's still it's it's complex and it's complex because one thing we all agree on those of us who study this idea of space and when i'm saying space too i'm not talking outer space right? i'm not talking stars and moons and stuff like that i'm talking about here on planet earth around us we have places and we have spaces Right? And people kind of, you know, we kind of know what it means, but we kind of don't know what it means. So one thing that we geographers and those in philosophers and people who have studied uh, this idea of space, one thing we all pretty much agree on is that it is a social construct, which I think, but every day is a blur, I think we've talked about that term uh, in here already, but it's the idea that a social construct means it's the opposite of being natural, okay? Something being natural means that we discovered it out in nature, right? Or it's something that's inherent in our genetic code or, or something like that, right? So nature is where stuff just kind of is because of, you know, however you, you frame this, whether it's because a god or gods made it that way or chemical reactions and, you know, natural selection and stuff like that made it this way or you know whatever it doesn't really matter what, how it got there it's just it's it's nature it's it would be like this even if humans didn't mess with it okay a social construct is where you know this is stuff humans make up it's a cultural thing it's something that doesn't naturally exist in this way it's something that we with our brains and with our interactions and stuff like that we've kind of made into something, right? So our, our, so what I should say here is it's our conception of space or how we define space. It's, it's clearly, it's something we people produce, we make through our daily lives, all right? Another thing a lot of people agree with is that it is linked to time. <coughs> Although that, I mean, some people get kind of fixated on the time thing and overlook space. Other people we talked about during Massey, you know, who was her whole thing was like, enough of the time already. Let's talk about space. Let's get into where this stuff is happening. Not not this false sense of when it's happening and, and all that, but there's there's kind of that. 
well, one thing we'll talk about here, I'm not gonna get into it now, but the space-time compression, that's a way in which it can be linked. And it's generally speaking, we'll talk about this with globalization, but it's the idea that the, the um, uh, as we kind of shrink the time it takes to get from point A to point B, right, through technology or whatever, we're also shrinking space or compressing it, right? So it's the idea if you have to walk, say from, uh, well, let's just say from Antelope Valley College to Edwards Air Force Base, right? Out in the outskirts of the desert, out outside of Rosamond there, right? If you had to walk that, that's going to take a long time. It's going to be a hard thing to do. But if you have a bike instead, right? You can bicycle out uh, from, from ABC to Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, okay, it's still going to suck, but you can do it. It'll be easier. It won't take you the 20 hours or whatever the walking would. It'll be more like, I don't know, four hours uh, to ride out there. I mean, I've never actually ridden straight there, so I don't even know how far it is. But you, you get what I'm saying. Uh, and then if you can take your car, that's going to change it as well. So with a car, you can get, I don't know, from ABC to Edwards, what, 20, 30 minutes, something like that. Um, that's going to shrink that space. Right? It's not going to feel as long. So that's what that means. Uh, and then this quote here, the space is the movement between places. Remember the thing from Yi Fu Tuan? That's something that, that students like. Um, and, and many of you will have said something kind of like that when uh, we originally were discussing it. And that's something that um, I, I don't think is good because it implies that you can't produce spaces in a place. Right, that it, you can't do this in an, an actual location. It's always on the go, and, and I'm gonna disagree with that, and, and we'll get into it. But you can see, it's there's a lot of like there's no good definition. And that said, I'm not gonna test you here in the midterm. I'm not gonna say, well, what's the definition of space? Because that would take too long, right? But I just want you to be aware, space is a complex concept. So we're gonna talk about. We're gonna we're gonna talk some Lefebvre. Um, this is this French philosopher guy, uh, and I love me the French philosophers. Even the, it can be a love hate kind of thing because sometimes it can be so difficult to uh, read and get and, and all of that. But but I found honestly, if you stick with it. It, it, it opens your mind, man. It, it makes you think differently. Uh, about the world, uh, and and so Lefebvre is is no exception there. He he's written a lot of stuff, um, but this one book, The Production of Space, it's a massive book. It's over four hundred pages, all about how we humans, it's a social construct, how we humans produce space. All right, and in, in classic, you know, uh, uh, philosophy stuff. It's it's not like a uh, like on page four hundred you get to the end and it's like and therefore here is my definition of space and now you know everything. No, it's it's a little more open ended than that. But I'm gonna I'm gonna get you guys. Uh, we're we're gonna we're gonna jam with this right here. This is some good stuff that we we typically give to our grad students um, to to start you know dealing with and learning about and all that. I ain't got time for that. I think you guys are ready. If I can be perfectly honest, having never spent any time in a room with you, um, you know, at this, or whatever, week five of the semester, wherever we're at uh, right now, I feel you're ready. I feel you are just as talented as any master's uh, or PhD geography student. Don't you worry. No, we're, we'll go through it. This, this doesn't have to be as difficult as we kind of make it. I think it's useful for thinking about the world and thinking about your your report uh, that you're going to do. So we're going to get in here in his idea here. And he's got this tripartite framework. And you know what tripartite means? The three part. It's a fancy way. See, this is philosophy. My God, this is what people do. And to be fair, I mean, he's writing in French. I don't know. With the, I haven't read the French. I've read the translation. It might, it might be the, the translator who's, who's picking some of these terms, but still, this is one hurdle when dealing with this stuff, is instead of saying, I got this three-part framework, we say uh, uh, tripartite, right? Sounds smarter, but it's, it's three parts, 
example, all right? So here's how space is produced or how to understand how it's produced here. We're going to look at spatial practice, number one. And then we've got representations of space. And then number three is representational spaces. So that's fun, right? Two and three sound pretty much identical here. And again, I don't know if that's a translation thing or what, but it's obnoxious. But we're going to get through it. All right, so we got number one, spatial practice. Number two, representations of space. Number three, representational spaces. And once we get through these, it's all going to be crystal clear. So let's get going. Let's start with number one. And we're not actually, we're not, this, I don't think this is a good place to start uh, at all. So we're going to come back to number one. Don't worry. Don't worry, baby geographers. You got this. You are fine. You're going to get it. It's going to be, it's going to be too easy. Representations of space. Those, and you're quoting Lefebvre, tied to the relations of production and to the order which those relations impose and hence to knowledge to signs, to codes, and to frontal relations. Now, a few things here. When he's saying relations of production, he's talking capitalism. He's talking about the economy, right? The jobs that we we have and do and, and all that. Um, and order. So you can think power. We've got to talk about that already. Uh, frontal relations. We'll actually talk about this idea of front versus back regions and encounters and stuff like that later. Um, but really, the, the easy way to think about it is a representation of space. It's a space of control and order. All right? It's, it's where there's, there's some kind of governmental control. All right? I think there is no better illustration of a representation of space than a courthouse and even a courtroom itself. All right. So you could, I mean, you could say like a courthouse, it's a place, right? It's a location. It has an address. We know where it is. We can point to it on the map. We can drive there and have, you know, our, our phones tell us how to get there and, and all that. So it is a place. There's some space going in, uh, going on in there. And, and it's definitely, it's a representation of space using Lefebvre's framework here, his tripartite framework. All right, so there's control and order going on. Now, if you've been into a courthouse before, you know, you've experienced it. And I love to ask the students, you know, how many of you people have been in a courthouse or a courtroom? And only a few people will actually raise their hand. I think most of you probably have been. You just don't want to make it look like you're the criminals that you are. Uh, don't worry, I've been in them. I've been in them for, for good and bad reasons. It, it, it happens. Life happens. Um... But it's the idea that uh, within there, there's some specific stuff going on, all right? And I actually had, oh my God, I had the privilege of serving on a jury. That was a few years ago now. Um, but let me tell you, now it's, it's you know, like the judge, um, you know, he said, it's your civic duty. And like, this is something we need to take seriously and yada, yada, yada. I'd never want to do this ever again. It is the worst thing in the world. I have a whole host of issues with it, but I got I got pulled in. I got selected for a jury. It was just it it happened. And the one good thing about being on this jury was that I got I, you know I, I I listen. I was paying attention to the case. I wasn't goofing off or whatever, but I was in full geographer mode the whole time and really you know just just having fun uh, thinking about. This idea of a space of control and order. Uh, when you enter into the courthouse itself, what do you got to do first? You got to go through security, right? Pass through a metal detector, all that. That right there, think about that. You don't have to do that in every single building that exists uh, in, you know, in town, wherever you encounter. There are only certain ones where we have to do this right off the bat. It's producing the sense of control, of order. You're allowed to bring certain things in. Other things are not allowed in. There are clearly people in charge in here, right? The various law enforcement officials that are working in the courthouse, uh, the people who have guns and all of that, that's kind of a big clue that they get to 
say what goes. Um, but yeah, so you, you pass through there. And you could say, like, yeah, I mean, you know, you got to do it, right? Because if you don't do that, people are going to bring in their own weapons because they don't want to go to jail or, you know, whatever. And so you got to do it. But what I love about it, and a lot of this stuff, like the idea of a metal detector, it's such a performative thing, meaning that it's not, it's not perfect, and we don't even need it to be perfect. Like, while I was on this jury, it was a week or so, and I was in there going every day, you know, checking in and doing that. Like, halfway through that week, the metal detector died. It stopped working. So the, the guy at the work on the metal detector there, instead he just had the wand thing. And so you'd walk through it still, because you still had to do that to get in. Um, but it would beep no matter what. Uh, and you'd say, oh, okay, okay, hold on, yeah, it's broken. Let me check. And, and he'd, you know, size you up. But the one thing he had me do, and everybody else do, is we had to lift up our right legs and pull up our pant leg to show that we didn't have some kind of boot knife or gun down there, grenades or like whatever, right? And so you'd, you'd lift up that leg and you'd pull up the, the pant leg and he'd see if there were no weapons there and, and that was and that was it. Just my right leg. That's the thing I love. I could have had anything strapped to my left leg, but it didn't matter because I guess he assumed nobody would do that. I, like, I don't know, but that was all he checked, you know, let alone the, you know, missiles I could have in, in my back, you know, uh, pocket of my pants or, or what. Like, it just, it made no sense whatsoever, but it made everybody kind of feel good, right? So there was no logic whatsoever, but it still it maintained this idea of control and order, even if people were smuggling in weapons like crazy, right? It was still producing that space. When you go in to the actual courtroom itself, so you go in there, whether you're on a jury duty, jury duty, or just there for a field trip, or you know, like whatever, or you're, you know, you're, you're in some trouble. Um, you know, when you go in there, first off, is the judge in there greeting you? I mean, like, hey, welcome, come on in, have a seat. Anything's open, right? Is the judge in there? No, no, the judge isn't in there. Right off the bat, where are they? Yeah, well, and you're, hopefully you're shouting at your computer or phone or, or whatever. Uh, but as for that, they're in their chambers, right? This is what students will shout in class, and they say, chambers, right? What the, what the hell are chambers? It's an office, right? The the judge is in, in his or her office, just, just hanging out um, in there, waiting to arrive fashionably late, right? To It's a power move. That's what it is. A call it chambers, and B, show up late. Those are two big power moves right there. Like, can you imagine if, if I said, you know, I'll be holding chambers hours or, or things like that, or if somebody said, like, uh, uh, yeah, come on over to my chambers, and then we'll sign that document. Over. Like, it just sounds pretentious as hell, but in the courtroom, it works. And the whole idea of the, the courthouse in general, it works, and it's part of this whole representation of space. Just the names that we use, that's producing control and order. And is the judge, what are they wearing? Are they just in there, you know, whatever, jeans and a t-shirt? No, we don't, we don't even know what they're really wearing because they wear robes, robes. And they come in and they, of course, they don't, they're not down there with you. They're up, they're elevated. I mean, just think about that whole scene, right? All of that is control and order. It's a representation of space. The courthouse itself or the courtroom, there's nothing necessarily special about it. It's still a room. It's a building. It's a thing with four walls and all that stuff. But it's the stuff that's going on in there. It's going to make you behave a certain way. It's going to make you feel a certain way. If we go into a courtroom, we're going to behave, typically speaking, not everybody. Uh, is going to necessarily do that. But it just, there's that vibe of power, of order, of discipline, of, of these things. And, you know, another thing with this is, yeah, that's what's there. Some people go into that and they're like, finally, this is my place. This feels good, right? That was, oh my God, on this jury. Because, um, you know, we, we heard all this stuff and then it was time for us to go back and deliberate or whatever they say. And one of the first things we had to do was we had to pick 
a foreman, um, uh, or maybe foreperson, I don't know if, if they use that gender neutral term or whatever, but I, I seem to remember it was, we, we need a jury foreman. We need some leader of the 12 jurors to, to help, again, you know, maintain control and order, right? So we have to elect someone. And the guy that wound up doing it, um, God, you could tell he was so excited. He was he was just so into all of this and thought it was awesome. Uh, and he's like, well, if nobody minds, I'll, I'll do it. And the rest of them like, yeah, knock yourself out, pal. Um, you know, so he loved this stuff. The idea of being in a representation of space in this sense was fantastic for him. Others, myself included, like all of this control and order and all that felt oppressive. I didn't like it. The idea of, of not being in control myself and having others control me, it just, yeah, not my thing, right? I mean, I felt safe in there because I hadn't committed a crime, right? I wasn't sitting there uh, at the little defense table. I wasn't in handcuffs. Um, you know, I wasn't trying to, like, you know, smuggle in stuff or whatever. So I had no reason to worry that, like, some bailiff was going to jump on me. Um, but at the same time, it's just that it's that oppressive thing of me not having the control, right? So I, I didn't really feel that great uh, in there. Never want to do jury duty again. You know, the idea of me being in control of someone's, you know, whether they go to jail for a long time or not, that's weird. Um, but so you can see, like, it's it's not the place necessarily itself, like in terms of the building or whatever, but it's what's happening inside there, right? What are we doing that's going to produce a certain type of space? And then also who we are is going to determine how do we feel about that space? Do we like it? Do we not like it? All right, what exactly is going on? So that's that's this second part of the three-part deal here, a representation of space, a space of control and order. And then a representational space, it's, uh, it's a symbolic space. It's a lived space. It's quoting Lefebvre. It's linked to the clandestine or underground side of social life as also to art. And this is, I mean, this is romantic um, in here, definitely. But this whole idea of like underground, it's got this like resistance vibe to it. Um, where it's, it's the idea of, uh, you know, you've got these places of control and order, but then you've got the place where you can escape all that. And you can just be yourself, right? You can you can do what you want. And it's a place where it's emotion um, is there in terms of either, you know, producing art or just feeling good or just laughing or, or whatever. You know, that's, that's what a representational space is. And these spaces, these can happen again, in buildings, in places, structures, and all, all that stuff. It's But it's what's going on inside there. And this is kind of weird, too, um, because, well, actually, no. You know what? Let's let's make lemonade out of lemons and, and all that stuff. Oh, in fact, here we go. Here, okay, now I'm, we're, we're jamming. We're doing some geography here. So, because I was going to talk about school, like if we're at ABC, because we'd be in a classroom, and I'd say, like, you could have this classroom, you know, with a professor that is just there about, like, let's just, you know, chat about stuff and produce stuff and come up with new ideas and be productive uh, in this way. And you can have a classroom with with a professor who's all about, like, you know, you get here, and you make sure your phones are off, and you're here on time, and if you're not here two times in a row, I'd drop you on, and you need to be quiet and face for, you know, that kind of stuff, right? Um so then, like we have that at a, a college, you can have the same room, different professors. You can have one class could be a representation of space, one could be a representational space. That can happen. And I'm thinking about it, like with all this Zoom stuff and this online stuff that's going on during the coronavirus. What's crazy is your own house, wherever you're doing the school, in your kitchen, bedroom, whatever it is. Um, that it, it can be like when everything's shut off, like let's say it's your bedroom, right? Where you're, you're doing stuff. Um, uh, you, that, like that's, that, your bedroom is like the most representational of spaces and that it's, I mean, you don't get more 
underground um, or away from control and all that than you do when you're in your own safe space. Or at least hopefully that's what it feels like for you, right? Like when I was growing up, I, I was fortunate to have my own room. Um, and I, as such, I could, you know, do whatever I wanted in there. Uh, you know, I could, I could shut the door and, and my parents always were happy to not have to put up with me and and to parent, uh, and all that, but I could also be in there and it's not like I was doing, you know, crazy illegal stuff or, or what I didn't have a meth lab or something like that, but I could just go in there and just like do whatever because it was my space, right? It was a safe space. We want to use that overused, often mocked term. But yeah, I could do whatever I wanted in there, and that's fantastic, right? Um, so maybe, so let's say, so you're in your bedroom. It's a representation space. That's your space. But then you're taking these Zoom classes, right? And so you've got a desk in there, and you've got your computer, uh, and you're you know logging into those those classes where they make you do the Zoom meetings, right? And so you go in there, and you could have one class that is fantastic, right? That is, it keeps it as that uh, representational space where it's it's just you're you're hanging, you're you know the teacher is like yeah, keep your camera on or off, whatever, mute, whatever. I'm gonna demonstrate this stuff. You do whatever, and you can you know wear pajamas and you can eat and and those kinds of things, right? So it's cool. But then, I've been hearing about this, and it's terrifying to me, and it's the whole reason why I'm doing like this Zoom stuff, and I'm trying to be as flexible to help you guys out as much as possible. But do you have, my God, do you have these instructors in your other classes that are, um, uh, what's a good term, Nazis uh, when it comes to this stuff? Like, you got to have the camera on, and you got to be dressed uh, appropriately and know eating and, and all of that stuff, even though you're sitting in your own home. Yeah, and that I've been I've been reading about these, you know, online and, and you know, seeing news articles and little discussion forums and stuff like that about this stuff. Uh, and it's it's terrifying. And then there's also like there's the test taking stuff where you've got the this this uh, control and order software. So you're at Canvas you're taking your classes, uh, or you're taking your tests, uh, and you've got the webcam is recording you, and if your eyes dart to the side one too many times, uh, you're you're clearly cheating, and you get a zero and everything gets shut down. I mean, that's terrifying. But what's also crazy, it's like, what does that do to your bedroom at that moment, right? It turns your bedroom into a representation of space, into a space of control and order. It is a totally different experience when you have that awful professor forcing you to to obey, right? Whereas if you once you shut the computer and you walk away from that stuff, that same room, that same location will go back to being a representational space where you can do whatever. Once that webcam is unplugged, the laptop is shut, you know, whatever it, it might be. Right, so you can see same location, but the different experiences that's going to affect what that space is, and that is what spatial practice means. All right, the stuff we do, the everyday life, the routine that we go through. It's it's stuff that you know we think of as as completely cultural. It's other stuff we might describe more as social. These interactions we have versus like beliefs or tradition or or whatever but really it's just the stuff we experience that's what spatial practice is getting at and that's what lefebvre is really getting at it's the idea that we are producing spaces just through how we're moving through life right how we're we're going through uh, all this stuff that's uh, the idea and maybe it could even be something else uh, out there right that's the kind of thing like i like Lefebvre. He's writing all these pages and it's given some examples and stuff, but it's kind of open-ended. There are other ways we can think about how space is produced or things that he was talking about. He initially wrote this back in the 70s. It was translated in the 90s, but this is clearly pre-Zoom classes and, and the internet being the internet and, and all that kind of stuff. 
right? So it's like, you know, what everyday life even means or how we experience or interact stuff. That, that's changing, right? And we're seeing this pandemic, how that's changing. But that's definitely affecting these, these spaces that uh, are being produced. So, okay, what does that have to do with our whole Anno Valley Sense of Place stuff? Well, I'm glad you asked. So we go back here to the boulevard. Um, you know, and I'm not going to dwell too much on, uh, on this stuff because it really works better when we're in a classroom and we can all talk about this stuff. But just think, look at the boulevard. When you look at that, do you think uh, that's, a, that's a space where I can, I can be myself? It's a place of art and, and all that. Because, I mean, it's the idea was supposed to be this place of art and emotion. It was really, when it was initially pitched, it was a representational space. They didn't say that. You didn't have like Rex Paris saying like, eh, according to Lefebvre, um, I don't know how he talks. Um, but you know, that, they didn't get into the French philosophy of it, but it, the whole idea was, you know, there's gonna be art. It's gonna be a place where you can just go and experience and, and all that. That was, that was the push. But is it that? Is it truly that? Or is it more of a representation of space? Is what goes on here, is it something more of control and order? Like you've got art museums, but you also have a sheriff station right there too, right? And again, it's the idea where these two separate things could, uh, you know, it could be one of them, but it could also be a thing like, you know, I've been to the boulevard and sometimes it feels like a representational space and other times it feels like a representation of space, you know, based on the web stuff. Um, and it could also be a thing of, that's, that's good. I like the control and order, like the, you know, jury foreman guy that uh, I encounter where it's like, oh, yeah, so I love it uh, because I always feel like, you know, Big Brother is watching. Um, but then at the the other hand, you could have somebody who's going like, oh, I can't stand, I don't want to go there because it feels like Big Brother is watching, right? So think about whatever place you pick. Again, I'm not saying you have to do the boulevard, but whatever you do, this part of, of Palmdale, this part of Acton, Lake LA, Little Rock, whatever you're dealing with, you know, those pictures you take, think, did I take a picture of a representational space? A representation of space? You know, that might help you write this this paper, right? And you don't have to use Lefebvre's idea. You don't have to use insider outsider perspectives or any of this stuff, but I'm just throwing them out here. These are tools that we have that you can pluck out of your toolbox and you can say, okay, I'm, I'm studying this photograph, whatever this photograph is. What's the best tool I have to really an, uh, analyze this, right? Think of it in that way. So always, yeah, just think about what kind of space is being produced, and therefore, how does that affect my sense of place? How I feel about it? All right, authenticity. It's giving me some really good stuff here. What, what does it mean to be authentic or in, inauthentic? Right? Uh, curse this this disease. I, I really wish we could be in class to argue uh, over this stuff. Uh, let me just show you how how messy this term fuzzy dare I say, this term authenticity is. This is a picture I took in Boston years ago. I was on a bus and it was it was pulling away as I'm fiddling with my cell phone to, to take the picture. That's why it's cut off here. Terrible photo, but it works. Um, it, so Cheers was a TV show. Kids, you children, you millennials or Zoomers or whatever you are. Kids back in the day, when we had a handful of television channels and all that, you know, watching our, our TV shows in the evening, that was a really important thing to do. Uh, and, and one such show that was very popular was Cheers, and it took place in a bar, and it was, it, it Cheers, it made alcoholism funny. Um, it is pretty much it. Again, the 80s, 90s, great time to be alive, uh, and how awful uh, everything was. But that was the idea. It took place in a bar, and you had crazy bar people and hijinks, and ha, ha, ha. So the show has been on the air for many years, but Boston, which is where it took place, it was in the city of Boston. Boston has been milking this whole Cheers thing for ever. They're still doing it, right? So it's Cheers is the name of the show, and it's just the place where everybody knows your name. That was part of the TV show right there. But it says now, 
at two locations. Number one, the authentic replica of the Cheers Hollywood set. Authentic replica. If I say that one more time, my head will explode. That doesn't make sense, right? Authentic replica. But you can do it. You see that. But like you can buy jerseys and stuff like that. Uh, your favorite athlete. And it's an authentic replica. Same kind of, oh, there I said it again. Oh, uh, it exploded. Um, but it's the same. Like, if you think about it, it doesn't make anything, any, any sense at all, right? To be authentic would mean that it's not a replica, one might think. Um, but there you go. So there's that one, right? And then there's the original inspiration for the setting of the TV series. So think about that. So you've got this one bar that's not going to look anything like your TV show, but it's the place where the guys who made the show, like they went in and had some drinks, and they're like, oh man, what if we made a TV show about this? And so you could go there and go like, wow, this is where the Cheers magic happened. But you could go there and you'd be like, well, what the hell is this? This doesn't look like Cheers, right? This doesn't look like the place I know and love. So instead you'd go to the authentic replica of the Hollywood set, right? So the thing that was actually built on the other side of the country We've reproduced it here in Boston so that you can have that experience, even though it's not really authentic, although it's technically authentic because we put the Cheers logo. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, right? Authenticity is kind of crazy. Um, and it turns out there are multiple types of authenticity in here. And I'll go through these. We have number one, we have object authenticity. All right, stuff, things. This is an antiquities thing. Archaeology, museums, stuff like that. Like you go into a museum, you're not going there to see authentic replicas, right? You want to go see the thing, right? Like this picture here, this is a Moche earplug. We know it is because it was pulled off of some mummy that was found somewhere in Peru. All right, so it's like this is a gold uh, and turquoise decoration that went on some king or, or whatever. Uh, that's the real deal. That is authentic because we took it off the dead body and pulled it out of the tomb. All right? That's that's how authenticity really started. Yeah, it's either real or it's not. It's either the original thing or it's not. All right? But then we have what's called constructive authenticity. So it's not inherently authentic, but we view it as being authentic. Right? It's the idea that it's not, it's not like it was just, you know, plucked out of uh, the dead king's tomb, but it's still, it's, it's, it's pretty legit. Right? So this here's another Peruvian example, uh, an image of Machu Picchu, which is an incredible sign. I, I got to go there many years ago now. Uh, and it is, it's an amazing place. It's just, it's a cool place to go. But what you don't see when you take pictures, and I'm kicking myself for not taking the picture when I was there. But this is the spot where you stand and you have this good frame of the whole thing and you take pictures there. And you wait for other tourists to finish and then you take the picture that you could just pull off of Google. Um, you know, if you ever really went to look at it. But that's, uh, that's what you do, right? But if you swung the camera to the left here, you would see the turnstiles that you walk through. You buy a ticket, and just like going on a ride at Disneyland or getting on the subway or whatever, you have to walk through the turnstiles, pass through there, turn in the ticket, and then you can go down and see this thing. That really screws up the authentic vibe, right? The authenticity is challenged with stuff like that. And you get down there, and a lot of this stuff, like when it was discovered, that's in the, the quote fingers there, there's a white guy um, who discovered it, but like all the people who lived there, all the actual Peruvians who lived there, they knew it was there, right? Everybody knew it was there, and it was overgrown with, you know, jungle vegetation and all that, it was just like, yeah, it's more more old Inca shit that we got, like it's everywhere in this area, so it wasn't a big deal, but the white guy goes in uh, and, you know, makes the discovery in uh, Eureka, uh, and so the jungle vegetation is cleared back, and some of these buildings are are rebuilt. And it kind of just when I was there, yeah, you could tell, right, which ones were originally standing in this way, and the other ones that were put back together didn't have that Incan craftsmanship um, in there. 
right? But when I went there, like it didn't feel like it was a phony experience, right? Because it was there. This is the actual location where Incan rulers, you know, hung out. Uh, and, and it's the actual stonework. And there's some amazing stuff uh, in there. So we'd call this constructive authenticity, right? It's not exactly as it was or the original, but it works, right? Nobody's saying this is completely phony, right? Completely fake. So that's what constructive authenticity means. Now, number three, existential authenticity. This, this one is fantastic. This is where it's subjective. Right? The idea of an existentially authentic experience, it means that within your own mind, your own self, your own sense of being, you felt valid. You felt authentic. You felt like you had this authentic experience. And quite often that can be you see through the phoniness, and in doing so, you have a great time. And it's actually better than if you actually went to the original, perhaps. Okay, the example here, this is, I've never been here, but this was from a research thing I did many years ago, looking at long distance cyclists uh, and bike tours, people who would load up camping equipment and clothes and supplies and all of that onto their bicycle and travel for hundreds of miles, right? Just slowly riding along, camping out, riding some more, Many of these people go from one coast to the other. They go all the way across the United States by bicycle. Other people would just, you know, take a lengthy journey of some kind of, of you know, significant amount, right? So, and I, I read through journals of people who did this and was studying this and connecting it to landscapes and, and all that. And so this one woman, she wrote a lot. Like she did, you know, like 3,000, maybe 4,000 miles and everything. It was all said and done, like all thousands of miles, again, on a bike, carrying everything she needed. Pretty impressive feat. And when you're doing that, you're traveling in a different way. And so some things you might want to go see, if you're in a car, it's no big deal. But if you have to pedal, that's going to be work, right? So like she went to see some natural bridge. I think, I want to say this in Virginia or somewhere on the East Coast. And she went to a place. And she saw this natural feature, and it just sucked. Like, yeah, it was authentic in the sense that it was this natural landform out in the woods. Um, but it just, it was hard to get there, and it wasn't that fantastic, and it just sucked. But then as she's getting back on her route and heading to wherever it was she was heading, she also, she saw the sign for Foamhenge, right? It's like Stonehenge back in merry old England, but... It's made out of styrofoam. Now, no one is going to say that Foamhenge is like authentic, right? Or you're not going to go to Foamhenge and be like, well, now I don't need to see the real one, right? This is obviously goofy crap right here. And you can even see with the, the picture here that the styrofoam isn't even looking that hot. There's some little white bits. The spray paint is, is um, missing from areas. But this woman went into this place, went to uh, Foam Edge and had the greatest time ever, right? Because of course it's stupid. That's what makes it great, right? Way better than the actual authentic natural thing that she intended to go see, went to this goofy thing and had the best time ever. She had an existentially authentic experience, right? So that can be the thing that like if you went to the authentic replica Cheers Hollywood set thing, <clears throat> you can go there and still feel that it's authentic if you have this authentic experience, right? Vegas, that's a great example. Nobody goes to these Vegas hotels. Like Nobody goes to the Paris Casino uh, and sees that little Eiffel Tower there and, you know, sees the paintings inside and, you know, all the, the stuff in there. Nobody goes like, well, good, I can cross Paris off my list. I never need to go see that. No, we know it's not authentic in the object or the constructive authenticity kind of definitions. But we can go there and say, this is, this is goofy as hell, but I'm having a great time precisely because it's goofy as hell, right? That's existential authenticity. And again, this is something maybe 
This idea of authenticity works with your sense of place, right? Maybe, and like the boulevard is why I use it here. Do you know what the boulevard is supposed to be? I forget what town it was supposed to be based off of, but it's a Spanish town or city. I don't, I don't know which one. I can't remember, but there's a specific city or town or village or something in Spain that we based the boulevard off of. So authenticity right there. It's like the authentic replica of, I don't know, Barcelona or whatever one of is supposed to be. I don't know. Uh, you could maybe make that argument, um, but you can think about that, right? Like uh, like that fact that the, the boulevard is, is copied off of some Spanish boulevard. Does that mean anything? Maybe it does. Maybe it doesn't. Or does that other thing that you're actually taking the pictures of that you're writing about? Does authenticity play a role? You know, in any way. We have in the AV, we've got some impressive stuff out here. Like, like on IBC campus, we have one of the uh, jets that broke the sound barrier or whatever. It's there, kind of neglected on campus. And everybody thinks it looks cheesy as hell um, because there's no engine or anything in there. We put some red plastic in the back to make it look like fire was ready to shoot out or, or whatever. But what's crazy is that's like, that's something that like Chuck Yeager was uh, flying around in, right? To, to actually break the sound barrier and led to, you know, all sorts of, you know, going into space and, and stuff like that. Like we've got some of that stuff here um, in the Animal Valley. And that that's kind of weird. And again, that can be, we've got like the authenticity but then that can also add to representations of space, like the control and order of the U.S. military and so Like, there's a lot there, right? Maybe you've thought about it before. Maybe you haven't. Maybe aerospace is connected to how you feel about this place. You know, does authenticity have anything to do with that? Maybe, maybe not. But that's how you could use this, these concepts, again, as tools for your paper. All right, let's let's keep moving here. We're, we're getting close. Uh, so we're going to talk some sociology. Some sociologists are good. Um, a useful, uh, but Goffman here did this whole presentation of self in everyday life. It's the idea of, of as we're going through our everyday lives, we are putting on a show, right? We're performing. We're presenting ourselves. And depending on whether we're going into a front region or back region, that's going to affect the performance. That's the idea. So when he says region, it's not like regions from the geography sense that we talked about, formal, functional, vernacular, that kind of stuff. Instead, he's really saying it's like a, it's a room, right? It's some kind of place with that you can enter and exit from, all right? That's what he means here. And it's also been used, uh, also say, front stage or backstage, which kind of further leans into this whole performance, you know, metaphor thing, right? But just think, any any room, any place that you can go into and leave, that's that's what we're talking about, all right? And so a front region is one where the performance is happening, and then the back region is where the suppressed facts make an appearance, right? Quoting Goffman. And you remember Lefebvre had that quote about frontal regions there, you, you know, that was connected to the representations of space. Um, see, any a front region, there's some control and order there. We're putting on a show. We're, tr we're trying to project who we want people to think we are, whether that's who we are or not, right? And then back regions, it's where we can be who we actually are, where we can just let it all hang out, right? Um, that's, that's the idea. Now, within a front region, when you enter into one, there are things that we do as we're putting on this show, all right? And one such thing is decorum, right? which is just decorum is, is referring to, it's, it's a cultural thing. We learn how to do this, but it's, it's a, a refined or pleasant exper uh, appearance, right? It's the idea that I am, I'm, I'm looking sharp, I'm looking good i'm smiling everything everything's working here and, and i think a great example of our flight attendants 
of decor. Right? You, if you've been on a plane uh, and you're flying along, you've got flight attendants who their whole thing is decorum in that they are supposed to look you know, clean, professional, um, happy, pleasant, all, all of this stuff, and whether they feel that way or not. All right? and, and I love this, like, I love this picture so bad right here. Look at those eyes, those dead eyes right there. She does not care if you know to put the little oxygen mask on yourself before assisting others or whatever. She is, she's dead inside right there. But you don't know it. Like if you just start talking, uh, you wouldn't know that. I took this from Google, by the way. I'm not creepy. Like I don't fly from plane and just take pictures of these flight attendants. No, I let other people do that and I steal it from Google. Um, but it's the idea, right? She's putting on a show and the uniform and the little flower, whatever that is right there, handkerchief, I don't know. Uh, it's all, it's all doing something right there. It's all decorum. Same thing, offering this, I don't know, what is that, sushi, whatever it is, um, in, you know, on the plane, maybe in business class where that looks pretty, pretty nice right there. And she's just smiling, she doesn't want to help you. Um, she's she thinks you're obnoxious. You've been because you've had you know one too many drinks and you're you're taking her smile. It's kind of like you know like she's into you, but she's not really into you. You know, it's just decorum. These for these poor women, right? They're, they're dead inside. Is the only way I can think about it. But it's that frontal region kind of stuff, front stage stuff. They're not gonna let you know that they're disgusted by you, that they're tired, that they hate their jobs, that they wish they had had you know picked another career path or, or whatever. They're just going to be like, yep, thank you for flying with br 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 airlines. That's decor. All right. Another thing we do in front regions, is what's called make work, all right? which is the idea of we do work. It doesn't really need to be done, but we want to make it look like we're busy, that we're productive, that we're hard workers. All right. One of the best thing, a bit of advice I ever got was I started working, you know, in, in high school is, is somebody said to me, um, you know, what you do if you're, you're, you know, working at a place, uh, always have a broom nearby so that if you really don't have anything to do, but the boss comes in, you can just, you know, be sweeping, right? Making it look like you, you got to clean the floor. And that way the boss won't say, Hey, what am I paying you for? You know, do this other awful job. No, the boss will be like, Oh, this, this person is, this is a good employee. Look at that. And then once the boss leaves, you put the broom down and you go back to, you know, whatever it is you're doing, right? And we do that. Like if we were actually in a classroom, you guys would be doing that. You'd be making it look like you're taking notes just so I wouldn't call on you, even though you're not taking notes at all. I know what you're doing. I invented that move. Um, yeah, I totally get it, right? We do that in all sorts of ex different experiences that, that we have, different encounters throughout the day, or like the phone. The phone is a great way to do this. We have these phones in our pockets that we can pull out, and if I don't want to talk to somebody, I can make it look like I'm, I'm responding to an important email or, or text, or I'm looking something up, so that way they don't come over and bug me. Even though I just, I don't got anything to do, I just don't want to talk to this person because he bores me, or you know, whatever it might be. So that's make work. But then what you can also do is, is what's called make no work, right? which is where you make it look like you're cool. You're as cool as can be, like, ah, don't worry about it. That kind of deal, even though you are busy, frantic, exhausted, and, and all of that, right? So you're trying to make it look like you're not busy. Make it look like, oh, this is a piece of cake, you got this under control. But that's, again, just a one of these front region uh, things we do. That's the performance. In reality, we're stressed out Everything's a mess, but we don't want to let people know that, you know, for whatever reason. Now, the back region is where we don't have to do that. We don't have to worry about decorum. We don't have to worry about, you know, making work or making no work or putting on a show at all. A back region is, according to Goffman, where the performer can relax. He can drop his front, forego speaking his lines, and step out of character, right? So we get that, that stage performance theater uh, metaphor right there. So you can just be who you are in this back region. And we see these uh, a whole host of different 
places, like like with uh, entrances to, you know, businesses, stores, things like that. Quite often there's the main entrance where customers or clients are supposed to walk through, and then there'll be the service entrance, right? The back entrance where the employees enter the building. And it's the idea of you don't have to have that decorum right off the bat if you're entering from the back or if it's stuff like things are being delivered or or whatever some kind of work is being done that you don't want the customer or client to see you you're hiding that right so the front region would be where the customers are going into the store but the back region is where the actual work is being done same thing with break rooms or restrooms or, or the restaurant kitchen is a good example of this and i know a lot of you guys you've had these jobs where you've done this this front region, back region kind of stuff, right? It's yeah, you're dealing with customers. You got to deal with this. Uh, it's just, it's an unfortunate thing where you've got to have yeah, that decorum and you've got to say, yes, the customer is always right and put up with that. And then you go into the break room or you go into the kitchen or you go wherever and you're like, God dang it, what a moron, right? You do that. I've done that. Um, you know, when I, well, when I had to work, retail jobs and service-based jobs and all that at the welder school and and uh, oh, just awful people are awful and you, you I'm convinced you know it's not a bold thing to say but I'm convinced that anybody who is a complete jerk face uh, you know in a store uh, in a restaurant or whatever to that person who's making minimum wage who's you know just just trying to get by uh, anybody who's that obnoxious you know, they've never been in that situation, right? They've never worked at a restaurant or in retail or something like like that, and they haven't had to deal with jerk faces themselves. It's awful. But at least you have that back region where you can go and just curse this person out or with you know other people and all that. That's what's going on. And these front regions and back regions, they can also be more subtle than clearly divided by a room. Uh, this was something... Back at our, our good old uh, Subway sandwich thing in the Uhazy Hall building at ABC, uh, I was I was there. Stand late, had to get uh, one of their delicious sandwiches uh, before my night class or whatever it was. And so I'm waiting in line, and I see this, and I take a picture. Ooh, I'm I'm excited uh, because a back region is facing the front region, right? I can see this on the back of this thing. It was it was pictures of soups. Right of their different subway soups that uh, you are just supposed to look delicious and all that, but on this side, this is the side I'm not supposed to see. Right, it's supposed to be facing the employees, and it's reminding them, hey, don't forget to suggest soup. And in case you're not smart enough to think of a good way to suggest soup, you know they tell you, ask, would you like soup with that sandwich? Right, and so, like I know. If I'm in line at a subway and somebody says to me, hey, would you like some soup with that sandwich? Like, I know they're supposed to say that, but this was, was just fantastic because I'm seeing the secrets. Yeah, and I know what you're thinking. Think, it's soup, man. Chill out. But this, this, not just soup. This is the idea of, of the front and back region. It's bigger, bigger than soup. Just this concept right here, right? Don't judge me taking pictures of the subway. Um, it's it you're seeing what you're not supposed to see. That can be an exciting, fun thing, right? Maybe not in, revolved around soup stuff, but you know other stuff. Like you can think. I mean, not to take it to a total downer extreme, but think of all the instances of police brutality that America has been witnessing, that the world has been witnessing. I mean, really, you could say it goes back to the Watts riots back in the 60s and, and all that. But like in recent years, going back to Ferguson and, and you know, modern stuff with Breonna Taylor and George Floyd. And, and you know, we're, we're seeing really a lot of this stuff that's being recorded by civilians. It's kind of, you can kind of think of that as almost like a back region, right? Even though it's not in a place, it's the kind of thing that, the average citizen, the average non-police officer, law enforcement citizen, is supposed to see. And then, you know, you get into the question of, are these, you know, the few bad apples? Is this something the whole idea of law enforcement is revolved around? You know, that's the discussion to have. But 
Like that's that's a way to think of a back region and what that means when people who aren't supposed to see it actually see it, right? Ho ho, bigger than soup. Um, but I also I love how you know how dumb uh, uh, corporations treat their employees when you see stuff um, like you know do not add fresh soup to old soup and and stuff like that. Um, yeah. So okay. So hopefully that makes sense. Front regions back regions soup and all that um but here's the deal when we see a back region are we really seeing a back region right it ties into a fourth type of authenticity it's called staged authenticity this guy dean mccann who was up at uc davis years ago uh he came up with this idea and i think it's useful and so it's the idea that a place or culture that is presented as authentic and he's saying it from a, a tourism studies perspective. Um, but you could, you know, it doesn't have to be a place or culture. We could just say a thing, right? Something, some object, some whatever that is presented as authentic, but its very presentation keeps it from being truly authentic, right? So it's, it's the idea, you might think you're seeing a back region, but you're not, all right? And, and, uh, an example, I think, a, well, one of my favorite places ever. Um, you recognize this this location here? It's, not, it's not the, the savannah of uh, you know, Kenya um, or anything like that. This is in LA. It's the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. If you've never been, you should go just because it's a good nerdy experience. I love it. Yeah, well, I worked there. This was like my first real, like after I graduated, I worked there for a little bit. I'd been there before, but I got a job. And it was just, uh, I guess I was a nerd. You know, it was, it was exciting to work there, give tours and, and educate. I was an, an educator um, uh, there and, and so got to, you know, talk about stuff. But I also just love certain things. So this is in the Hall of African Mammals. And so they have these these rooms, these big rooms, and they've got these dioramas. And so this is a great example of authenticity. Okay, in that that these elephants we're looking at, they're real elephant. It's real elephant material, right? The tusks, the skin, that kind of stuff. And that's that's object authenticity. Those used to be walking around living elephants. They're not living anymore. Uh, I'd love to say that it was for natural causes, but honestly, with a lot of these museums, the way they got this kind of stuff is they sent dudes out uh, to wherever and had them, you know, get some specimens, shoot some. Uh, ele- I'm sure that I'm sure the baby was not killed. I'm sure that was. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of dark, evil. Um, so we wonder why some of these things are endangered today, right? Um, but so you know, that's the actual elephant material. But it's not, it's not like a real elephant, right? So we could say it's constructive authenticity because it, um, it, you know, it's not, it's not a real elephant walking around, but it's real elephant stuff. It's done in a way to be authentic. We can get something from there. We could also say like, for me, this room, it wasn't a case of like, I didn't need it to be, to feel like, well, I never have to go anywhere in Africa because I've seen these different mammals that exist there. No, there's also kind of an existential authenticity in that I just, I felt strangely calm, like surrounded by all this death, but it's dimly lit. It's a very dark thing, and you've got these still animals, and everyone's quiet in there. It's maybe one of the most peaceful places in the world for me, right? So whenever I go, I have an existential, existentially authentic experience in here, right? Because it's all about me and personal subjective stuff. All right. But then what about staged authenticity? Now, well, you can't see that necessarily here. There are other parts of the museum, like not too far from here. You can see currently, uh, I, I think it's you know still the case. I mean, nobody's in there right now with COVID. But you can see uh, paleontologists working on dinosaur fossils, right? They're behind glass. So you see them working. Um, and so you, the, the museum patron, you can walk through, you can see real paleontologists working with real um, dinosaur bones. And, and it just, you know, it feels like you're seeing the back region, right? That you're seeing, oh, this is what's happening. 
in the museum. This is how the museum works. No, when we got like mechanical, it's like that staged authenticity. It's presented as being authentic. It's presented as being a back region where like the real work is being done. This is the stuff that most people don't get to see. You see the front region stuff of this Hall of African Mammals. You don't normally get to see this. Yeah, well, what's happening is, um, you know, they're presenting this back region, but in doing so, it's not really authentic because they're they're showing they're still showing you what they want you to see, and the employees are not going to totally, you know, let it all loose and back there. They're not going to be you know drinking and smoking and you know all of that. They're they're going to be uh, you know aware of the fact that they're putting on a performance, right? But now the real back region, this is one of the greatest things about working there, is you really get to go behind the scenes and see the evil that lurks in the museum. Um, I'll never forget. So I got, you know, when I first got there, the first week, you're kind of taken around, given this, this special tour, meeting people. It, it was fantastic, but I'll never forget when I went into the Pelt Room, where it was a climate-controlled vault that we went into. And p picture every endangered big cat out in the wild, multiple skins of these things. So you just walk in, and there's that, there's a smell, this leathery smell. Like, it's not a bad smell, but it's kind of, it's disturbing in, like, how pleasant it can be, but also what you're seeing. And it's just... You know, tiger, 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 Siberian tiger, Siberian tiger, lion, lion, you know, snow leopard, snow leopard. Like, it's just, oh, it was so depressing and fascinating. And it's all stuff. It was explained to me that, like, yeah, this is stuff that was collected a hundred years ago. Hunters went out, shot this stuff. We can't show this to the public anymore because it's so depressing and evil. But it's back here because we don't want to just throw it away. Researchers can use it if you want to look at, you know, tiger stripe patterns or what have you. Got plenty of different ones to look at. Um, so it's there for scientific research, but the, the it's never going down that front region. We're not going to use this to show to museum patrons because everybody's going to start crying because it's just too depressing, right? So that's an actual back region, not the thing that we, you know, that is being presented, not seeing the paleontologists work behind glass, right? Whenever you get some kind of factory tour, get to peek into a kitchen or whatever, staged authenticity. Like, have you been, have you guys gone on the uh, Tabasco sauce uh, factory tour in southern Louisiana? You haven't? Oh, well, it's just me. I, I get, yeah, this is what my parents did. Um, I have family in Louisiana and throughout the south, and we would go every summer, and it gets to a point where, there's only so much you can do to impress, um, you know, children and keep them busy and all that. But we did. We went on the Tabasco sauce factory tour, and I learned stuff that I still have today. Like, did you know that, uh, well, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, right where LSU is, uh, it means red stick. And it's from this stick that the the workers used out in the field, La Petite Baton Rouge, the little the little red stick. Right, that's painted red, and they would hold it up, and if the pepper is that same red, the pepper is right. Right, it, it's ready to be picked, and that, that's what they would do. See, I learned that. I was like nine. It's still in my head, right, because because we did that kind of stuff. But we went on a tour. Like, that was supposed to be exciting to see, you know, these women bottling Tabasco sauce or whatever. But the thing is, we didn't really see them working because they knew that this collection of, of me and my cousins, you know, being marched through here, forced to see this stuff, they know we're watching. So they're not going to be smoking over the Tabasco sauce and, and, you know, picking their noses or whatever. It's staged, right? Staged authenticity. Now, again, just wrapping it up with this stuff, I would simply say, as you're thinking about your Animal Valley sense of play stuff, are you looking at... A front region? Are you looking at a back region? Is it staged authenticity? You know, like why you feel the way you do about a place. Maybe you know you take a picture of like sometimes a lot of students take a picture of uh, one of the movie theaters, 
out here. Totally fine. You can still do it, even though I mentioned it. But it's just because, you know, going to the movies, that's an important thing for whatever reason. But is it important because you you just like the movies and that's where you hang out with your friends? Uh, do you work there? Have you encountered the back regions? Has that made you feel a certain way, right? Like, think about whatever it is you are taking a picture of. Are you seeing it from the front region? Or have you experienced it from the back region? Or is there some kind of staged authenticity thing going on? Look, these are other tools. It's up to you. Take these pictures of, of you know, two pictures of whatever. And look, whatever. And talk to me if you're concerned or worried. But, you know, have at it. Uh, and think about all this stuff. Why do I feel the way I do about it? But not just like, you know, at that kind of, you know, freshman in high school kind of level like it makes me happy and you know like okay good you get an a for that no we're in college you're geographers god dang it um so what i want you to do is really think about like what's going on here how can i critically analyze this sense of place why i feel the way i do how it's been produced um you know all of that kind of stuff all right you got this and i as cheesy as that i do look forward to reading these because I'm learning so much new stuff. I've been doing this for, you know, about a decade now, assigning this paper uh, or something, you know, relatively close to it. Uh, and I learn, actually, no, it's only been about five years since I've done this version of it. But still, that's a lot of different students writing these papers. And it's every year I still, I see new stuff. I think about stuff differently because the student will just, they'll have a different perspective. So even if it doesn't seem that exciting to you, and it's just kind of, I don't know, it's just, you know, it's Palmdale, but, you know, whatever. Really, really go for it, because the students who really go for it, well, I love it, and of course, they, if you do a good job, and you really are, are trying here, you're going to get an A, you're going to, you know, do well in this class, and, and do well in college, and, and be a successful human being, um, so really try for that stuff, but but keep that in mind. This isn't busy work. This is, this is fun for me to, to learn about it, and hopefully it'll get you thinking about this place in a way you haven't before. All right, geographers, happy writing, happy photo taking and all that. And until next time, uh, uh, have a lovely, lovely rest of your day.